first presentation tonight comes from Parks Canada, Dave Ness. After working in a consulting firm, Dave joined Parks Canada in 2004. He is a water management engineer for Ontario Waterways, which includes the Weedle Canal and the Trent Severn Waterways. <coughs> Dave has a bachelor's degree in civil engineering with an emphasis on water resources and structural engineering. So call up to the podium, Dave. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much. Um, on behalf of Parks Canada, uh, it's a real, uh, real pleasure to be invited here to speak here tonight um, to discuss uh, the water management program of, of the Rideau Canal. Um, and just to go through, uh, to provide some clarification on sort of the structures along the Rideau Canal system, as well as, uh, as, um, well as how, how water is managed within that system and the methodology that we employ uh, to do so. Uh, next slide, please. So, as, as we all very well know, the Rio Canal has a historic beginning, uh, built by Colonel By uh, over the course of six years, which is a, a phenomenal feat in itself, uh, given, you know, the sort of, uh, um, the sister canal, the trans Southern Waterway, took decades and decades and decades to construct. Um, uh, Colonel By was able to do it in, over the course of a six-year period, which is just monumental. Uh, given the time of its construction, um, originally built um, to serve military and commercial purposes, uh, just a phenomenal feat through the heart of uh, the nation's capital, down to Kingston, uh, basically joining your, the Ottawa River to Lake Ontario. Uh, next slide, please. Here we can see the overview of the Rideau Canal, and I'll just step away from the podium briefly. Um, you can see, obviously, the canal starting up in Ottawa, and it runs the entire length of the Rideau River, all the way up to sort of its headwater reservoirs um, in the form of Big Rideau Lake, Upper Radar, where then it then crosses um, the, the boundary between the Cataraqui River and the Rideau River as it flows down out through the, the Cataraqui Lakes out through Kingston. Next slide, please. I want to take a minute to discuss the, the operations policies that are in place for many of the lakes along the Rideau Canal system. Um, these policies all stem sort of from historic operation that were solidified back in 1994 uh, with a study done by a third party consultant. And basically the, the intention of the operating policies lay out in the form of a rule curve, target water levels to be attained for every day of the year. So where we've got large reservoirs, you can see that say in, in the course of the winter you'll be at sort of lower levels and then as the spring of the year commences, this time of year, the rule curves will typically rise up to holding levels across the core of the summer, and then with evaporation losses, the water levels will then de uh, decline down in the fall of the year, where then water levels are held. And these these rule curves are, um, while they they vary a little bit lake to lake, the they all re remain sort of relatively similar in terms of lower levels in the winter, escalating in the spring, plateauing in the summer, and then declining off through the fall. And so those, those curves are really the way in which we manage the water along the Rideau Canal uh, to hit our optimum levels throughout the year. Next slide, please. The snow is an especially important component of what's driving decision making coming into the spring of the year. And so we take great efforts in collecting snow water equivalent. There's two, there's two components to uh, snow course analysis um, that are conducted not only by conservation authorities, uh, like the Cataraqui region and Rideau Valley, um, but the Trans Severn Waterway and the Rideau Canal are also conducting snow survey analysis uh, throughout those two systems. And so the two means by which we do that is either manual snow courses, um, where we have snow sampling equipment, employees, uh, crews deployed uh, out on a weekly basis to determine the depth and snow water equivalent of the snowpack. And when I say snow water equivalent, that's really if you take a sample of snow and melt it down, how much water is it going to yield when you, when you melt that snow down? That collect those samples in real time. Because as any, anyone would sort of logically know, is as the snow is melting, it's very difficult to be out every day collecting that information from several sites around the watershed. So the automated snow monitoring stations allow us to, we get that snow water equivalent information in real time, sort of uh, remote, uh, with remote monitoring. Next slide, please. So like I say, the snow course information is very important because what we're doing here is, is taking the snow course information and then spreading it out across the system. And so 
Using this approach, we can then estimate the subbasin snow water equivalents river by river and lake by lake. And so what that gives you the opportunity to do is it gives the estimated amount of water that is going to enter each subbasin. Um, those subbasins analysis determine whether we're going to have a surplus of water or a deficit of water within within that subbasin itself. So we're also comparing at the same time water levels collected by remote monitoring stations and determine how much room there are in our lakes. When we're at the bottom of our operating curves, okay, how much room do we have in that lake? And is that snow going to simply fill that lake up and generate a surplus? Or is there not enough snow to fill it at all and we're going to have a def deficit situation? Um, now, of course, the snow is only one part of the picture. There's also rainfall to be accounted for in there as well, as we all know. Um, but it does form the foundation for coming into the spring of the year uh, as to where the lake should be uh, in preparation for spring. Next slide, please. So how do we, how do we track water levels? Um, we do that by a very sophisticated remote monitoring network. Um, here are some of the examples of, of remote monitoring across the Rideau Canal system. Um, this is one of our oldest stations downstream of the Punamali Dam, um, Grass Point Bridge, and you can see actually there's a rainfall monitoring station right affixed right to the top of the rooftop of that building. And we've got several remote rainfall monitoring stations deployed on the rooftops of buildings so that you know, not only are we monitoring water levels in that location, but we're also monitoring uh, rainfall. Um, you can see here a couple of the installations only just can, uh, installed this last, uh, last few months. We've deployed about 10 new monitoring stations along the Rideau River system to provide our, our staff with real-time decision making on where water levels in those river reaches are. So that's, that is how we're tracking. So these stations are recording water levels hour by hour as well as rainfall hour by hour, so that when we're doing, we do a sort of a 24 hour operational cycle, we can assess those water levels recordings, determine how the lakes are trending and rivers are trending, if they're trending up slightly, down slightly, the rate of rise, and make informed dam decisions um, about uh, what to do with either the vertical lift gates or stop logs, or in some of the cases, some of our infrastructure with our overflow weirs that are largely self regulated Next slide, please. So I wanted, to, I wanted to talk about some of the infrastructure along the Rideau River. Um, I'm not going to steal the thunder of uh, the, the, Ottawa, the Ottawa ice work, but um, I did want I did want to just briefly touch on, on the first slide here, um, is the dams at Rideau Falls. Those, those two dams are not uh, Parks Canada infrastructure, um, so I'll, uh, I'll perhaps let uh, some other folks talk about that. But just a quick photo about the, uh, the uh, de-icing efforts, because we do try to assist as best possible with the ice flush in Ottawa. Um, in years where we've got lots of water, it's a fairly si simple endeavor, but uh, as I'm sure it probably will be shared later on uh, tonight, um, when there's times of uh, lesser water in the system, uh, a, bit of a, a bit more of a challenge in terms of ice, the ice flush. But going up the river, we've got sort of, we've got hogs back, Black Rapids, and an interesting thing about like a dam, for example, like Black Rapids is, these, these large overflow sections of these dams, while they're excellent in terms of minimizing dam operations, uh, because normally you know the water, water levels will rise up on those reaches and simply pour over those spill walls, they're not, they're not all that great in terms of flood water impoundment because they have a natural sort of crest across them and you have no real ability to raise that dam any further than it's already been constructed. So that's, this is why I wanted to run through some of the, the infrastructure along the, uh, along the Rideau River. Next slide, please. So you can see uh, similarly up at Barrett Chute, you've got Nicholson's here. This has got a smaller sort of overflow crest weir, Klaus Lock. Again, that's sort of that, uh, you can see uh, Colonel By sort of had a, a real good flavor in mind when he was building these dams because they all sort of have this large, long regulating weir with the, with the exclusion of some. Merrickville, for example, does not have the long um, overtop weir. It's, uh, it's comprised of three, three uh, stop log weirs, where one of the stop log weirs, number one weir, has been converted to a vertical left gate. And there's also a hydroelectric generating facility there in Merrickville. Next slide, please. Uh, similarly, going uh, further up river, you've got the Edmonds spill wall, uh, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty clearly seen from the highway. Old Slides, again, Old Slides doesn't have the, uh, the large overflow crest weir. It, sing it has a single stop log spillway. Getting up into further into uh, combined right in the town of Smith Falls, 
into detached. And then the next sort of next dam up is the Punamali Dam, where we've got a 50-foot radial gate. Um, and, but it's also got the, the sides of that dam also lend itself to spilling over as well. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the infrastructure along, uh, along the way. So really, the run, the run of the Rideau River, there's no storage capacity. It is, it is a straight river shot. There's the really the only storage capacity occurs upstream of these facilities in the form of Big Rideau Lake, Upper Rideau, Bob's Lake, and Wolf Lake. The run, the the Rito, the Rito River itself, the river reaches really don't have enough surface area. Number one, nor vertical storage differential to hold water back. There's there's no there's no storage capacity. There's simply river reaches that dams were put in place in order to permit navigation along the river. Next slide, please. And so this slide was intended to to try to try to demonstrate that a little bit better. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can see. We've got all sorts of unregulated inflows. We've got the Kempville, Jock, Cranberry, Stevens. These, all these rivers contribute directly, but you can see there's no lakes. There's no lakes. Basically, when you're going sort of from the Smith Falls area all the way up to Ottawa, that's what I mean when I say there's no storage capacity. It's just a straight <laughs> river section. Your, river, your, your storage capacity really comes at Wolf, Upper, Big Rito, Lower Rito, and, and Bob's Lake. That's where your storage capacity is held, and that's where the operating policies that we have on the, on the Rideau Canal are so important, where we've got those rule curves drawn down, that's where your storage is, is really being hit. So when we've got the spring of the year um, ensuing, the, the local, local tributaries of, say, the Jock, the Kempfell, local watersheds, there's no control over them. They're, gonna, they're going to come... They're going to peak when the freshet occurs, peak and discharge straight into the river, and there's really nothing anybody can do about that. Um, and so the intention is, though, is when you've got regulated and unregulated inflows, you don't want to have the peak of those two systems occur at the same time. The intention is that when you've got unregulated inflows, there's no control of, over what the height of the peak will be, the timing, the duration, nothing. But the intent is to augment those natural inflows with your regulated reservoirs. And that's the real sort of, that's the real trick on the Rideau River is really timing releases from your upper reservoirs so that they don't coincide with the peak on your unregulated river systems. And that's, that's, really, that's, that's really the real challenge of the management of the Rideau system um, is, is to really to counter those, the unregulated inflows. Next slide, please. So um, just in summary, you know, the operation of, of the dams along the Rideau Canal endeavors to address a lot of stakeholder needs, um, including, of course, recreational, municipal water supply, hydroelectric genera generation, <coughs> fisheries management, and flood mitigation. Um, but the unregulated unre inflows are a significant contributor to the overall flows of the Rideau River. Um, and while the dams, they really weren't initially built as flood sort of management structures. They're not floodways or anything like that. You know, the, the dams were originally built for, for navigation, and that's why, you know, a lot of them are those long sort of overtop spill dams. Um, it was for navigation between Kingston and, uh, and Ottawa. And so we've, we've tried to incorporate flood mitigation into the operation of those dams, but bearing in mind that that wasn't their original intent uh, nor function. And uh, next slide, please. Thank you very much. Okay.